Okay, it looks like it's noon. Thank you all for attending today. It's really great to see your faces and um, have you join us for this important webinar, How to Garden Without Toxic Pesticides. I'm Joyce Kennedy with People and Pollinators Action Network, or PPAN for short. And we're really pleased to be able to continue offering a series of educational webinars. Please continue to keep your eyes out for more of these opportunities and feel free to reach out to me during the webinar or afterward if you'd like to connect. Just a few words about PPAN before we turn this over to Michael. We're an advocacy organization and we're working across Colorado to educate and improve policies to better protect pollinators, people, and overall biodiversity by increasing safe habitat, improving land management practices, and reducing pesticide use. And we're doing that by building strong relationships and partnerships at the state and local level. And these connections are really important because we're working to address so many of the important issues and threats to pollinator health. And what we do is unique in Colorado and really regionally. What we like to say is the simple message is that we all can do something to support pollinator health by planting flowers, having something blooming throughout the growing season, and by not using pesticides in our gardens and on properties we may manage and by asking others to do the same. We will be keeping the audience muted during this presentation. So please use the chat box to ask questions and please address those questions to everyone so that the whole group can see them. We're going to do our best to answer those when the presentation concludes and we'll conclude at 1 p.m. But Michael has agreed to stay for an extra 10 or 15 minutes um, if there are additional questions. And we will be recording the webinar and we'll be posting it to our YouTube channel. So we are so lucky to have Michael Bronner with us today. As many of you already know, Michael and his wife Eve own Harlequin's Garden, Sustainable Nursery and Garden Center in North Boulder. And we know that this business is an absolute gem in our region and beyond. Michael has been researching alternatives to toxic pesticides for 45 years and growing them professionally without any pesticides for 28 years. So we're really lucky to have him and we look forward to hearing from Michael today. So I'm going to take down this screen and let Michael take it away. Greetings, fellow gardeners and plant caregivers. I'm Michael Bronner. Today I'm going to be talking about how to garden without pesticides. You know, as I was thinking about giving this talk, I was wondering what plants would think about this talk. And I imagine they might say, well, before humans, we never needed pesticides. We were strong and healthy. And now with all the poisons, our brothers and sisters, the insects and birds and butterflies and uh, fungi, uh, fungi and bacteria are all dying and, and, and suffering. Um, and, uh, and now here's this human tell us about how to garden without pesticides. Uh, we don't know whether to laugh or cry. But this is a, an important subject, of course. And um, the first thing I'd like to say about this is that, um, as Joyce mentioned, uh, at Harlequin's Gardens, our, our nursery, for 28 years, we've grown thousands of plants without using any toxic pesticides, fungicides, um, herbicides, or chemical fertilizers and our plants have been strong and healthy and have had a very good success um, for people to establish them in their gardens and uh, and i'm very proud of this because it really is proof that 
we don't need poisons to grow plants and we don't need oil to grow plants. And I think that's worth repeating. We don't need oil to grow plants. And I'm not the only one. There are thousands and thousands of other organic gardeners and farmers, organic farmers, who are growing plants without toxic pesticides. So there's plenty of examples that we really don't need this at all. Before I start with the body of the talk, I, I want to uh, introduce some perspective or uh, ground of, for, what, what, for what I'll be talking about. And this view, I'm going to say, consists of five points. The first point is that nature is intelligent. It's not just intelligent, it's beyond brilliant. Nature has adapted and evolved to support life in general and, uh, and, and uh, it has selected the very strongest methods and uh, has figured out how one, like the way that the soil life supports the plants and the plants support the soil life. And if we think we're smarter than that, we're just fooling ourselves. We should be sitting at the feet of Mother Nature learning. Point number two is that most insects and most bacteria and fungi and even viruses are beneficial or at least not problematic for us. Point number three is that the neonicotinoid pesticides Roundup, chemical fertilizers and chemical fungicides are extremely harmful to life. They not only kill the beings that, are, that, that constitute our ecology, but they weaken them and make them less capable of supporting themselves, defending themselves and reproducing themselves. Point four, nature is powerful. It's very powerful. And if we partner with nature, we can make use and, and, and partake of that power and, that, and have that intelligence on our side. And if we fight nature, if we war against nature, if we relate to nature the way that we've been taught um, by the oil industry to fight against our problems, then we will lose, as we have been losing over the last 70 years uh, with um, uh, soil loss and uh, uh, the requirements to, to, to do, use more pesticides and herbicides because our plants are weaker. And in fact, the, our foods have become less nutritious and we ourselves have become weaker. Point number five is that fertility is not a product made from oil. Fertility is a biological process that has evolved over thousands of years and is basically not just one thing, but a relationship between the soil life and the plants. So getting into the main body of the talk, it's important to understand that for the last 70 years, we have been conditioned and trained to use oil to grow plants. If the plants need fertilizer, we're taught to give them um, chemical fertilizers, which is basically made from natural gas. When our plants have pest problems we're, or diseases, we're taught to give them pesticides and fungicides and herbicides all made from oil. This has been an extremely profitable model for the pesticide industry and an extremely cost to life on earth. But we don't need to fight 
with our world. We don't need to wage war on nature. We can use what we might call artful diplomacy, where we can secure certain advantages like growing our own food without quality, or you might say without disrupting the ecosystems with life killing poisons. In an extreme pest infestation, we might have to resort to killing to reduce the pest population below a damaging level, but we would use a non-toxic method. Then we would work to improve our management to reduce or eliminate the need for killing. Basically, if we have a big pest problem, we've done something wrong, mostly. So is killing bad? Well, of course we kill to eat, clothe, and house ourselves. But the meaning of sustainability or regenerative living is that we are seeking a balance in our ecosystem. In order to do that, we have to support life much more than to kill or disrupt life. So how do we garden without toxic pesticides? There are several important practices to achieve this goal. One, the first step is to stop using all pesticides. I know this sounds like the goal, not the path, but in fact, it is the path. Because when we agree in our, in our hearts to stop using pesticides, it opens our eyes to seek alternatives to pesticides. It becomes a powerful incentive. This happened to me also when I was in 75, I was um, managing a small organic, well, it was a small nursery and I, a small uh, apple orchard, I mean. And I was trying to figure out how to do this management and I, and I looked into using uh, what I was being recommended by the, by the Iowa um, um, professors that was uh, all these pesticides. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized, no, I'm not going to use these. So when, when you decide not to use the pesticides, then you have to figure out, well, then what can I use? So that started off years and many years of research. And, and I have been researching ever since. And uh, for the last 28 years in the nursery business, I've been applying what I found in my research. And this has led me to being able to um, grow thousands of plants without these pesticides. Uh, the, the second thing about stopping to use pesticides is that you stop killing your allies, the beneficial insects that um, do a lot of the pest management uh, services for you. And, and if we kill those allies, then we have to assume the responsibility of taking over those pest management services ourselves. The other thing that happens is that besides beneficial insects, we uh, start increasing the soil biology, which are also allies of the plant world. The second important practice we might call nurture. I spent many years researching alternatives to pesticides and a major breakthrough in my understanding came when I learned that strong and healthy plants had very few pest problems and actually attract pests. If we were not brainwashed into thinking that we have to fight pests, it would be common sense to realize that plants have evolved to defend themselves they are rooted to the ground. They can't run away from there. So how do they defend them? Through chemical defense. They make themselves indigestible, bad tasting, actually poisonous or repellent. And they can only make these chemicals if the soil is healthy and full of the vitality and providing the nutrients that are necessary to build, to build this defense system. It's an interesting thing that plants actually will increase their defense medicines 
in response to being chewed on. So when somebody comes and shows me that there's a, there's a, a leaf on one of their plants that's got a hole in it, that doesn't panic me at all. I go, well, you know, actually when the plant feels that insect chewing on them, they begin to build their own defense systems even stronger. Uh, in fact, they, the studies have shown that even uh, the recorded sound of, of uh, pests, of insects chewing on the leaves will initiate the plants to increase their phytochemicals. So things like uh, essential oils and these phytochemicals, uh, phy cytokinins and antioxidants, um, these are chemicals that the plants produce to defend themselves. And it's an interesting thing that because plants have this um, intimate interrelation with, with the mycorrhizal fungi, that when they increase these defense chemicals in themselves, part of them naturally is leaked out through their roots to the mycorrhizae, which carry them to other plants further away and alert them to start improving and increasing their chemical defenses. So in Colorado, our soils are mostly deficient in nitrogen and organic matter. Our, we have this intense sun that bakes the ground and makes it hard reduces water infiltration and reduces soil life. So the health and vitality of the plants has to start with a healthy soil. Very simply, we can add compost, compost tea, composted healthy manures, not manures made from feed lots where they have all of these various chemicals in them, but healthy manures are fine, alfalfa, cover crops are good, especially those that fix nitrogen. We still are learning how to uh, apply cover crops in garden settings. It's much better known how to apply cover crops um, in farms, but we're learning about applying them in gardens. Uh, we can use sea minerals, um, seaweed, and it's also good to keep the soil covered with uh, plants and or a mulch. Building topsoil is a class in itself, and it may take a few years to build that up. It's an interesting thing that a healthy soil produces a healthy plant, and a healthy plant then has more capacity to produce more nutrients for the soil life, and then the soil life has more nutrients to provide to the plant, and this is a symbiotic relationship that we humans could learn from. Practice number three is good culture. For this, you have to know the plants. It's actually fun to get to know the plants, kind of like getting to know your neighbors. A vegetable garden needs a very different type of culture than a native uh, shrub garden. Um, some plants need shade, some plants need lots of sun, some plants like uh, a rich, really don't like that, they want a gra very gravelly, lean soil. But in general, plants need water, but not too much. Better to water deeply and seldom than, um, than, um, than to keep it watered uh, all the time, especially um, um, people who water every day think that they're doing the plants a, a, a service, but in fact, it's, uh, it's drowning the plants. They don't get enough air. When the soil is full of water, it drives out the air. A lot of landscapers know that, that overwatering kills more plants um, than underwatering. So the other thing, plants need some basic nutrition. And uh, this can be from fertilizers, but chemical fertilizers often cause too many problems. A lot of growers that used to depend a lot more on, on uh, high numbers of chemical fertilizers are realizing that that's actually causing a lot of problems. It makes the tissues of the plant soft, which makes them much more vulnerable to sucking insects like aphids and spider mites. And plants need um, 
the micronutrients which we do not get from chemical fertilizers. Uh, we get NPK, but we don't get calcium, boron, zinc, um, iron, and all of the micronutrients that are so important for helping to build the immune system of plants. We can get these from deep-rooted plants, which help to bring those nutrients up from deep down below, and from rock dusts and from seaweeds. The plants also need to be chosen to be adaptable to our local climate. Our, local, our low rainfall, our low humidity, shorter growing season, wind, and intense summer and winter sun. Having a green thumb really means that plants respond positively to human attention and care and love. Why should this be hard to believe? In the practice known as IPM, Integrated Pest Management, one of the things that's most important is what they, what they call monitoring, which is looking at the plants and seeing what's going on with them. Now, if they're not looking completely healthy, what do you do? You turn the leaf over and look underneath and see if you see any bugs. You look at it closely and see, is there any fungus? Um, no, plants can't talk back but it's sort of like bringing a baby home from the hospital. The baby can't tell you what it needs, but a mother or father paying close attention will start to pick up on feedback and understand what the baby needs, in this case, what the plant needs. There's an old saying that goes, the best application for the garden is the footprint of the gardener. Practice number four biodiversity in plants and in soil biology. A variety of plants supports a diversity of soil life and other life, a wide variety of flower sizes and types and bloom periods will support beneficial insects that will take care of a lot of the pest management for you. You might find my article on insectary plants very interesting explains this relationship and which, which plants that you can grow in your garden that will support beneficial insects. There's also a relatively new understanding in soil biology called quorum sensing that um, I heard about from this woman, Christine Jones. I think she's from Australia or maybe from New Zealand. Uh, this quorum sensing reveals how a diverse plant community can support a dynamic response between soil organisms and plants that increases fertility and even gene operations. Practice number five is don't panic at the first sign of pests. Like I mentioned, most insects are actually beneficial. Um, you should get to know the insects and get to recognize the beneficial insects. There's a, a way it works in, in, in nature. First, the pests come. They start feeding on the plants and the smell of their excrement or the vibration, the sound of chewing, then attracts the predators that come to eat them and the parasitoids that come to lay their eggs on them. This works very well for a lot of insects, especially things like aphids. There are, um, there are some very difficult to control pests like blister beetles that can completely defoliate uh, clematis in, um, in a couple days. Uh, flea beetles that you may know eat your tomatoes. Current worms that can defoliate um, uh, gooseberries or currants. And Japanese beetles, of course, that feed on roses and many other things and certain diseases. For them, we need to act quickly but in general, it's important to allow at least 10% of your plants to be damaged before interfering. Because if you don't do that and you get in and you, and you kill off, you'll be removing the food for the beneficial insects. There's an interesting story that I would like to tell about, um, about the Boulder Duchambe Tea House. My wife and I designed the rose garden at that tea house. 
first put in uh, the, the roses. Of course, we chose them to be very uh, disease resistant and strong and healthy for our environment. But um, the first year we did find some aphids and spider mites. And so I would go in with a little horticultural oil, which is a non-poisonous spray and uh, just spray a little bit here and a little bit there. But uh, it's, you know, it's a restaurant and people uh, would see me spraying and they would I'd panic. And so I thought, oh, I'll, I'll, next time I'll come. I brought a sign and the sign said, don't worry, completely non-toxic spray, won't hurt anything. Um, and the people were just like, <sighs> so I, I went back to the Rose Society and said, uh, you know, we, we can't spray. This is a restaurant. And people really don't like us to spray anything, even non-toxic things. So I said, well, what are, what are we going to do? Because a lot of these people were used to spraying their roses. And I said, well, let's try just spraying water. And some of them said, what's that? What good is that going to do to spray water? I said, well, it, it blows off the aphids and spider mites and um, let's just see. So the first year, maybe we sprayed water three times. The best time to do that is when the roses are in bud and before the flowers come out so you're not blowing off the blossoms. And you use a really strong blast of water and uh, you think, oh, the aphids will crawl back up. But no, the aphids are actually very vulnerable little things that nurse laid on this leaves. And uh, when you blow them off with water, not many come back. And the second year, we maybe did it twice. And after that, we have never sprayed anything. Partly what happened was that we also planted some herbs. The tea house wanted some uh, thyme and oregano, and they're very good at attracting uh, beneficial insects. And so from then on, there would be a few aphids and whatnot show up and then the beneficial insects would come in. They would start laying their eggs in the rose garden. And the only time we had any problem was when we had a new manager at the tea house who would see some aphids and panic and call me and say, oh my gosh, aphids. And I would come and I would point it out to him, you know, look at your customers. What are they doing? They're, they're having their picture taken with the roses. They're smelling the roses. They're not being bothered at all by a few aphids. And I said, so the other thing to do is to look at the, the, the density of aphids on the, on the roses and kind of memorize that. And then watch this. And if two weeks later, you see more aphids than you see now, call me back and I'll do something. They've never called me back. That's because by giving the beneficials a chance, they came in. The, the ladybugs, the lacewings, the serpent flies, they're living in the rose garden now and they're taking care of the problem for us. Practice number six is if the plant damage is rapid, serious, and more than 10 to 20%, use a non-toxic control. When killing pests, always leave 10% for food for the beneficials. Otherwise, they won't keep coming back. They won't lay their eggs, eggs there. You know, nature, like I said in the beginning, is very intelligent. Art. They know that if there's food there, there's going to be food there next year, and they'll lay their eggs there so that when their babies hatch, there will be food. Survival is what they, how they have maintained themselves for hundreds of years. So, so we need to respect that. So the non-toxic controls work in several ways. Horticultural oil is made either from a petroleum oil or a vegetable oil, and it acts by suffocation. It's mostly water. You know, oil and water don't mix, but you add a little soap and spray it over them. It has to touch the, the, the insect uh, in order to be effective. If you spray, Anything that comes afterwards will not be affected. You have to spray on top of the insect. But then it makes a thin film of oil over the top of the insect and it can't breathe through that and it, they suffocate. So um, they never get used to that. They don't, they don't build up any defense against not being able to breathe. 
Soaps, the insecticidal soaps, act by desiccation. Uh, it dries out the insect and they die. Diatomaceous earth, made from these little microscopic uh, sea creatures that uh, their, their skeletons are ground up into a fine powder, but you look at it under a microscope and there are all these sharp barbs. It scratches through the chitinous exoskeleton of the insects and they dehydrate. Neem, which you may have heard of, made from a subtro subtropical tree, acts as an antifeedant and a um, development antifeedant means they get they come to it and they just they go I don't want to, I don't want to eat this, or if it's an incident insect like a grasshopper that goes through ages and it has to molt in order to get to the next bigger stage. The, the neem prevents it from molting, and so it dies before it can get bigger. Um, I've used neem toothpaste for 20 years. So neem is not super toxic at all, but it is antibacterial, antifungal, and it does help to prevent, um, it does kill some insects. Then there are various sprays that you can use that use herbs or essential oils like rosemary, garlic, peppermint, chili pepper, that function to confuse, repel, and even kill pests. Unfortunately, we just lost one of our better non-toxic insecticides called the farm products, the P-H-A-R-M. I think you can still buy that in gallons, but it's too expensive for that average homeowner now. We used to have it in little quart spray bottles. And uh, the, the formulas sounded a lot like uh, salad dressing, but it was uh, very effective against a lot of insects. We have to hunt now and see if we can find another one, another non-toxic uh, alternative. Then there are various biological pesticides like this, also known as BT. That's a bacterial disease that's very effective against certain caterpillars like your cabbage moth. Um, uh, caterpillar. Um, also, it's even effective against certain beetles like flea, flea beetles and uh, Japanese beetles, although it is pretty expensive. Then there are um, uh, non-toxic herbicides like 20% um, vinegar and there are some citrus herbicides like something called Avenger. Of course, it has to have these horrible sounding names to sound effective. Um, a few years ago, my staff about five different non-toxic sides, and we found that three of them were practically ineffective. Uh, but the two that were effective were 20% vinegar and uh, the citrus-based uh, Avenger. Now, 20% vinegar is four times stronger acid than household vinegar. So you do need to be a little careful about using it. You don't want to get it in your eyes. So better not to spray on a windy day or use goggles. Um, it does acidify the soil a little bit, but that's usually a, a benefit because our soils are so alkaline. Um, the citrus um, doesn't have quite such a strong smell as the vinegar, and it seems to be quite effective as well. The other, another non-toxic herbicide is quite different. It's uh, called corn gluten. And corn gluten functions by preventing uh, seeds from germinating. So if you put it in your vegetable garden, it will prevent your vegetable seeds from germinating. So you have to be careful about using it. But where you're not putting down seed, like reseeding your lawn also, prevent those seeds from germinating, um, where you're not putting down seeds, it does prevent the weed seeds from germinating. Um, and if you apply it twice a year, you get a good control because it lasts about six months. Um, so you put it on in the early spring, April, March, April, and then again in the fall, um, in September, October, then you get a full year's cover. 
it's an interesting thing that it actually also fertilizes. It, 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 it is 9% nitrogen. So when you put it on your lawn, it uh, removes the necessity of doing one fertilization. It's an actual organic reed and feed. Then there are also some other so-called safe pesticides that I do not recommend, like the synthetic pyrethrums. So the old pyrethrum was the pyrethrum daisies that they just powdered the flowers and in, in natural sunlight, it would only last, the effectiveness would only be for a few hours. But now they've made synthetic pyrethroids and pyrethrins, and sometimes they even add synergists to it like PBO and various other things that make it even more toxic and longer lasting. Um, pyrethrums uh, are nerve toxins. Uh, they're not non-poisonous. Uh, they're quite poisonous and they can actually kill cats. Um, uh, spinosad is another um, supposedly non-toxic pesticide that uh, people are told they can use uh, after the sun goes down, but um, when, the, when the bees will not be flying, but in fact, I see plenty of bees flying after sundown. And, um, and so I don't rec recommend using that. Um, there are, there's, we used to have a good non-toxic fungicide called Green Cure. And uh, it was made from uh, potassium bicarbonate. Now that's closely related to baking soda. And baking soda itself works, but not as well as the potassium bicarbonate. Um, potassium bicarbonate is actually a food grade um, product that uh, is found in electrolyte drinks to provide the potassium. Um, uh, but it works very well as a non-toxic fungicide, but now, as sometimes happens, a big company bought, bought this company and then they, there's a little unclear as to what exactly happened. They either found out that it was competing with their products or they didn't, weren't making enough money from it or whatever. They took it off the market. Cure. So I'm on the look out for another potassium bicarbonate fungicide. If anybody hears about that, please let us know at Harlequin's Gardens. Um, this is actually uh, because we've just lost a couple of good um, non-toxic um, pest management products. We're on the lookout for some more. And if anybody finds any, we are really happy to listen to what you have to say. So kind of in conclusion here, um, repeat the view that all of this um, discussion has been in, um, in the perspective of. The view is that nature is intelligent. And if we um, respect that intelligence and instead of fighting against it, we will do better. Two, most insects are actually beneficial, as are most fungi and, and bacteria and even uh, viruses. Three, the neonicotinoid pesticides, the Roundup, the chemical fertilizers and the chemical fungicides kill and weaken our plants. You know, they've shown that um, very low doses of the neonicotinoids um, don't necessarily kill bees, but what they do is they weaken them. So it's a nerve toxin and it's a systemic. It gets into the groundwater, it moves through and it gets picked up by other flowering plants. And then the bees get, have their, their orientation, their, their um, ability to forage gets disrupted. Then they get weaker, then they can't defend themselves. So it's very insidious. And even small amounts of these neonicotinoids. So when you're, when you're trying to protect your ash trees against the emerald ash borer, most of what they're using are neonicotinoids. You know, read my article about, about emerald ash borer. Um, it's better to plant alternatives to ash. 
Four, nature is powerful. Um, if we partner with nature, we will partake of that power and that intelligence and, and, and it will support us. If we fight it, we will lose. Just like the, the, the farmers who have been using these toxic pesticides for years and now they're having to apply more and more insecticides to keep the pests under control, more water, um, the soil quality is going down, um, we're losing topsoil, uh, we're, it's not a direction we can keep doing, it's not sustainable. And, and number five is fertility is not a product made from oil, it is a biological process and a relationship between the soil life and the plant world. And, um, and so we, we would do well to with nature instead of trying to fight it. And that's really all that I have to say. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Such a wealth of information. We're so blessed to have you in this area so that you can help us with these issues. And uh, just a few comments and then we'll move on to some questions. If, if you all have enjoyed this webinar, we do um, ask that you would consider making a donation to People and Pollinators Action Network so we can continue to protect pollinators and people and also so that we can continue to bring you these educational webinars. You can donate at our website uh, peopleandpollinators.org. And thank you to those of you who have already made a donation. We really do appreciate that. That helps us a lot. We will be sending a follow-up message after the session with some key documents that Michael has shared with me. We'll also have a short survey for you to fill out so we can continue to improve our webinars. And there will be a link to our PPAN YouTube channel so that you'll get a sense of, or you may want to listen to this again. I know I'm going to want to. So um, if you follow the PPAN YouTube channel, you will get a notification um, of when that is posted. But I will try to do that very soon. And also, if you did sign up for this webinar, you will be on PPAN's email list now. Um, so you'll get all kinds of information about our events and information about pollinators and biodiversity and healthy environments generally. So we do have some time for questions and I will do my best to feed these along to Michael. Um, first, Michael, you mentioned a book earlier on. If you can just say the name of that again, somebody was asking. I don't remember mentioning a book. I mentioned that um, that uh, I had an article on in, insectary plants that people might find um, either on the email that you send them or on our website. Um, there's also I might I mentioned that Christine Jones um, uh, has this. Uh, a lot about um, soil health and about this interesting subject called quorum sensing. I don't remember if, if the person could remember, I don't remember naming a book. Okay, that, that may be the reference. And uh, that perennial topic, <laughs> uh, Japanese beetles, can you, I know this could be a whole webinar, but if you could address your perspective on how to control. Japanese beetles, please. Well, it's a long-winded subject and not a very cheerful subject because it's dip, it's not all that successful what we can do. The, the people in the eastern part of the United States have been having problems with Japanese beetles for many, many, many years. We just got them recently and they have not succeeded in coming up with a solution. And so we don't have one either. But so here's my two cents worth which is that uh, we do have a um, product uh, that's called Beetle Gone, and it's a Bacillus thuringiensis product that is a bacteria that will kill the beetles that eat it. Um, 
there's also another formulation of the same Bacillus thuringiensis that you can put in the soil that will kill the grubs, which is the, the larval stage of the Japanese beetle. Um, and so it sounds like it might be quite effective, but the problem is J Japanese beetles can fly for several miles. And so it, just because you're treating the Japanese beetles, your neighbors might not, and their neighbors might not, and their neighbors might not. So um, they'll keep coming. Uh, a lot of people have success um, with, with uh, hand picking them or one improved method is to take uh, soap in a gallon jug with a funnel and knock the Japanese beetle into the funnel and then it goes down into the soapy water and drowns. Uh, some people actually hand pick them and put them in the soapy water. Um, that's kind of like Benjamin Franklin's method for uh, dealing, his two cent method for dealing with, jet, with bed bugs. That's to take two pennies and put the bed bug between it and squeeze it. Um, uh, it's not that all that effective, but um, it does make you feel better. Um, we have been doing a lot of hand picking at the uh, Boulder Duchamp Bay Tea House. So the one other thing that is somewhat um, not always accepted uh, is the idea of trapping. And we do carry the lures that, that attracts the Japanese beetles. And uh, we have an improved method of having a five gallon bucket with soapy water in it and sticking the lure to the side of it and putting the lure upwind because the Japanese beetles often fly with the wind and uh, so they will get to, they will come to the bucket with the lure and the soapy water before they get to your roses or whatever, your grapes. Um, and uh, some people, including some people in the Rose Society have had good success with that. But that's, I'm afraid of about all that I can suggest. Thanks, Michael. Somebody has asked about addressing the value of using vermicompost as a fertilizer and protectant against disease, et cetera. Yes, well, once again, that kind of comes back to the subject of nature is intelligent. Uh, brilliant and, um, and like the very best thing. Uh, uh, the, the excrement that comes out of the worm, uh, the worm castings, um, is something like five times more calcium or four times more calcium than the soil that came into it, more phosphorus, more nitrogen, uh, more calcium. Um, and, 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 and so whatever goes through the worm comes out not only with more nutrients, but in a perfect form that uh, that is plant usable that is uh, uh, you know it has to be somewhat digested that's one of the things about the soil life being the digestive system of, of the plant world we have our digestive system inside us plants have their digestive system in the soil surrounding their roots and that and that soil life breaks down the nutrients and makes it puts it into a, an available form and worms are one part of that system um, and the, the worm castings themselves can be sprayed on uh, and made into a tea and sprayed on the leaves to prevent fungal diseases and i have done this and it does work um, part of how it works is that uh, the Worm castings contain a lot of, uh, of beneficial fungi um, and, um, and, and other nutrients. And so they help to uh, actually make the plants stronger and outcompete uh, the pest fungi. So, so uh, a lot of people make compost tea using uh, worm castings. Thanks. This is another uh, specific pest. Any recommendations for the brown stink bug on squash plants? Yeah, squash bugs are tough. Um, 
oftentimes the soft-bodied insects are the easiest to control. Anything with a hard shell often is more difficult. So it can be controlled with diatomaceous earth. Now, what I will often do with these hard-shelled insects is to first spray with something that's strongly repellent. Insects have a good, strong sense of smell and vibration and 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 whatnot. And so, by putting by spraying at first with some sort of herbal remedy that may not, in fact, kill the squash bug, it makes the environment less attractive for them and may actually disrupt their ability to find what they're looking for. Um, and then, while the plant is still damp. I'll sprinkle diatomaceous earth on it. Now, diatomaceous earth, uh, uh, in spite of the fact that it is non-toxic, uh, is something you do not want to breathe. It's got these scratchy Barbie things on it, and if you breathe it, uh, it can scratch your lung. So you do want to use a respirator, or at least do it when um, uh, when there's no wind. And so when the when the Hard-bodied insect crawls across the, the diatomaceous earth. It will scratch through their chitinous exoskeleton, and they will dehydrate. Okay, and uh, a comment. Uh, somebody says they have a hard time finding landscapers who know how to use natural practices. And I think that there are a few in Boulder County, but not so many in other places. So I would encourage anybody that does come across landscapers with knowledge of these special techniques to please send them my way. I get that type of question all the time. We are keeping a list of folks that do have that ability and we like to encourage more to learn about organic practices. So um, pl please be in touch if you do come across landscapers that have that knowledge and Michael, maybe you have something to add to that. Um, so let me think, there's Urban Oasis is one and um, I'll think of another one in a moment. But a lot of these, a lot of the people who are good at this are small companies that don't necessarily have a big profile, um, but, uh, but do have websites. And so I would suggest, you know, perusing the internet for people that, uh, that are presenting gardening without pesticides. Uh, did you mention an organic fertilizer for lawns, Michael? I'm not sure that I did, but there are a, there are a lot. So um, I mentioned a lot of different products, I, a lot of different um, types of fertilizers, but no, I don't think I mentioned uh, brands. But so what we carry is um, something called Nature Cycle, and it's a chicken manure-based fertilizer made in Platteville, Colorado. Um, that is uh, that's very good, recommended by the cooperative extension people for um, uh, berry bushes, but it actually works on lawns and uh, all kinds of um, uh, shrubs, especially. Then we all have a product called um, uh, um, Alpha One, which is an alfalfa-based fertilizer that uh, we've been selling for years and people have had good luck with. Um, yum yum mix is a very good organic fertilizer um, and there are others. Thank you. I'll mention that PPAN does of course encourage people to reduce their lawn size but we do have a lot of lawns so we like to teach people about ways to manage that organically and of course the, the big thing to do is to improve the health of your soil and we can do that um, with a, a number of different practices. We won't get into the details there, but certainly follow up. Uh, we have some resources if people have interest in ways to learn how to do that organically. Let's see what else we have here. 
Oh, somebody, I, I think you already addressed this. Is there any hope for ash trees? And I think basically what you said, Michael, was that we just need to diversify our tree canopy and uh, look for other species. Is that correct? Well, there is, there, there are sort of different ranges in toxicity to, um, to, to the controls for, and um, um, uh, imidacloprid is one of the most common ones used, and that is a neonicotinoid. But there is another one called triage, triage and that might even be a worse um, nerve toxin than, than imidacloprid. But there is one other one that is somewhat better, and that is called triazin. And it is made from neem, um, as in is the as as a directin. It's still injected into the tree, which I'm not totally in favor of. I think that it wounds the tree, and you, you know, you have to do this every year. Uh, some of them may say you only have to do every two years, but uh, you're wounding the tree over and over and over again. So. Even if you save the tree for 10 years, you may be killing it by the practice of wounding it. So I really think that the, 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 the main solution is going to be to place, to plant replacement trees. Yes, and I, I would agree with that for sure. I'm seeing lots of excellent comments in the chat box, so I encourage everybody to scroll through those. Uh, there's some, some nice ideas there for everybody. So please have a look at that. And we're, we're coming up on one o'clock, so I'm going to officially say thank you again to Michael Browner for um, joining us today and for all you do and for all of you that attended and are so interested in this subject and um, for, for making a change for the benefit of pollinators. So I um, hope you all stay safe and hope to see you again soon. We're going to stay on for another couple minutes and you're welcome to turn on your camera and your microphone and we can chat a little bit or you can take off um, and enjoy the rest of your day. So thanks again for coming. <laughs>